All right. No, it is. Yeah. Excuse the ignorance. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you this morning, our church family and, and guests that are visiting and enjoying the service together. And we want to welcome those who are participating in the worship service in the live stream online. Thank you so much for being with us together here this morning. And I know God has rich blessings for each of us as we worship him in study and praise this morning. Are you enjoying the return of warm weather, sunny weather? Oh, yes, right. And uh, are you taking advantage of this sunny weather? You know, a few months ago, there was an ice storm and took down a lot of trees at the campground, and, and I was able to haul home some wood from that. But I just stacked it up in the big rounds, you know, and now they need to be split. And I, I'm reminded that they're not going to be dry to provide uh, addition to the heat, addition to the electrical heat in our home unless I get it split and out in the sun to dry. Well, there are seasons when we need to grow in our relationship with God and we need to take those opportunities and one of those opportunities coming up just in a week and a half from now, a week and a couple of days from now, is what? Camp meeting, that's right. Camp meeting right on the grounds next to us over here. And you know, it's a time for us to fellowship together, to learn, to find new friends, and also to hear good speakers from all over the country. And we'll be gathering together there. The dates, as you can see on the screen, July 19 to 23, that's Tuesday night through Sabbath. Lots of good things planned for that over there. You know, in the Old Testament, God had his people gather together every, well, several times during the year. And he felt it was important enough for them to lay aside some of the other things. Even during harvest time, they were expected to be there to meet. And it was to praise the Lord and to grow in him. And that's what camp meeting is all about. You know, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we've had camp meetings from way back in the last millennium. But uh, it's a time for spiritual growth, and we encourage you to enjoy camp meeting those days. There's another <clears throat> important thing that this church is putting on. That's Vacation Bible School, and it's important for spiritual growth. Do you know that most decisions for Christ the majority of decisions for Christ are made in the childhood years. And that's what Vacation Bible School is all about. And that starts the 1st of August, August 1 to 5. And as you can see on the screen, the, the time is 9.30 to, uh, <clears throat> to 12.30. And it's for ages 5 to 11. I just want to encourage you to think of young people that you know, and encourage them to be there, encourage their parents to send them to Vacation Bible School. And if you have more questions about that, Suzette is the leader of Vacation Bible School, you can talk with her. And you know, the church provides for times of spiritual growth. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see things that are, that are going on, planned for this week. So we encourage you to find out from the church bulletin the things that are planned. One thing that uh, is in the church bulletin is a women's ministry breakfast tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock in the Fellowship Center. And uh, I don't know a lot about it, obvious, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I hope you can be there and enjoy that time of fellowship together. And uh, you're welcome to, all of you are welcome to enjoy a fellowship meal after this service in the Fellowship Center. And um, so take advantage of the things that are available at camp meeting, at VBS, and uh, during the church week. And I know you're going to be blessed this morning by Pastor Nate's sermon, Jehovah Jireh, reflecting a time of special spiritual growth in Abraham's life when he came to know that God provides. 
but we must take advantage of the times that God provides for our spiritual growth, and that's the purpose of things like camp meeting. I want to notice some persons that uh, we need to remember in our prayers. Rick Frazee is not in ICU anymore, but he's still in the hospital, but not uh, available for visitation yet. So that's mom, Janine Burville. Her health is uh, challenged, and also uh, Suzette's brother, James. And John Shermer's nephew, Jeremy, is in the hospital suffering from lung cancer, a young man. And uh, Kim and Bill Schroeder's daughter, Chelsea, last night had uh, a surgery, and they live way on the East Coast, but we've been praying for them, and remember to pray for, uh, for her as she recovers from surgery. And then this weekend is Impact for Health, up at the Portland Adventist Academy. It's for the community, it's free medical help and dental help for the community. So pray for those that are ministering there. And also, as it says in the bulletin, pray that God will call someone, get, uh, call staff to a special help in our youth department here at the church. I'd like to introduce the Gladstone family praise team as they come up this morning. We have uh, Carol and Michael Lynn, and Suzette, Doug, and Ron, and they'll be accompanied on the piano by Rosilia uh, with the violin by Margaret. Thank you all for coming to uh, help us all lift our voices in praise to God this morning. Let's... Um, <clears throat> Pay attention to our call to worship this morning from Exodus, the 15th chapter and verse 2. And uh, it's on the screen behind me. I invite you to read it along with me. This comes from the, it's, it's part of the Song of Moses, which Israel sang after their deliverance from Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. And this is what the people sang together. Repeat it with me, please. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. O oh Lord, be the strength and song of our lives today, and may our actions praise and exalt you in our witness for you this week.
are singing with us, right? Yeah. Amen. This is praise time. our prayer song, so I'd like you to stand with us and sing along with us. Glorify thy name.
of you who can, please bow with me as we pray. Almighty Father God, our blessed Redeemer and Spirit Guide, we praise you, our Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We come to worship and honor you, Lord, for we have found that truly you are a God who provides. For Abraham, you provided a lamb for a sacrifice in place of his son, Isaac. For us, you have provided Jesus, the Lamb of God, as our sacrifice in place of us. You are the God who provides. In fact, your word promises in Philippians 4.19, my God will provide all my, your needs according to his riches in glory. I've been challenged by that statement sometimes, Lord. But in the end, you have always provided. Praise your name. Ultimately, you have prepared a place for us, a heavenly home, a place where we'll be with you forever, free from the trials of this earth. So we praise you. You are our Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Because of that, we can come boldly to you this morning with our requests. And so we want to lift up Rick Frazee to you, Janine Burville, James, Jeremy, Chelsea, the Impact Your Health Clinic. And Lord, we pray that you will call youth leaders for our youth here in this church. We also lift up Ukraine to you and pray that your your people there who are worshiping you on this Sabbath will be given peace, peace for their country. Thank you, Lord. And as we end this time of prayer, I'd like to give us a moment of silent prayer for each, of, each, of, each person in our congregation to lift up their special needs and praises to you. Thank you, Lord. Our Jehovah Jireh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Lord, we do glorify your name. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. Happy to see your faces here this morning. What a blessing it is that we can come and worship together. Our um, offering this morning is for the world budget. And a lot of that goes to support missions around the world. They are um, gone to build schools and clinics, new churches, 
They're planting churches. Many ministries that are being supported by the church world budget. Now, one thing that they did want us to know is that um, even before COVID hit, <clears throat> some of the offerings have kind of gone down a bit um, supporting this ministry. So prayerfully think about the needs of this budget. Um, we are asked to go to go to the world. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We want as many people in heaven as is possible. So, prayerfully think about how you can support this, this work monetarily, but also in our daily lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we have the opportunity to come here and worship together. And I just pray that your work would go forward, Lord, in the rest of the world that the message of love and salvation and acceptance, forgiveness, eternal life with you, Lord, can go out. We thank you. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time for the children's story this morning. So kids, come on forward. And Miss Jean has a story for us today. Good morning, boys and girls. Wow, it's a long time since I said that to you, isn't it? But I'm so glad to be here today. I hope you all have a happy Sabbath. And hello to my old friends. And hi to my new ones. I'll meet you later. Well, they mentioned this morning that something special is going to happen down on the campgrounds. What's that going to be? What's coming up? Um, camp yeah, camp meeting. You know, I was a missionary in Africa, and we even have camp meeting over there. Did you know that? And so one time, my husband and I were up in the Kisi Highlands in Kenya, and oh, about 10,000 people come, and Pastor Jack would take our old Peugeot, and he would use the generator or the, the engine somehow, I don't know what he did, I'm not mechanical, he was, but he would uh, take a projector along and they would put two big poles in the ground and a sheet and you know what they did? They called it cinema. Yeah, cinema. We didn't have television out there up on the highlands, but anyway, we had a good time. And so Pastor Jack and I had a, a big green tent and we used to sleep in that every night and I don't know why they make tents with the flaps on the outside but they do and, and, and so every morning we'd wake up and our flaps would be lifted up and there were all these little brown faces looking to see what we were doing. <laughs> so we tried to get up before they did. <laughs> anyway, my job there was to tell stories to the children. I don't know why they gave me that job anyway. So I took my blanket and I put my blanket on the ground and the children would come and 
It might surprise you to know, but they all speak English in Kenya. In school, they learn English. So it was very easy for me. Um, I had trouble trying to learn their languages, but it was good to know I could tell a story and I didn't need a translator, because that takes up half your time. So I began telling a story, and then I saw this lady, there was a lady walking up along the top of the hillside, very straight, and she had a teapot on her head. You try doing that? But make sure you don't have anything in it, first of all. But this lady was very clever. She walked along, and every morning she would come to our tent and bring us a kettle of fresh Jersey milk. Wasn't that kind? And, you know, my husband and I, we really appreciated it, but we felt like we didn't want to take the milk away from her children. But when people give you a gift, you don't say no. So I saw her coming with the milk, and I knew she was going to the tent. And I was talking to the children, and I said to this lady's husband, James, who was one of my students, I said, James, I know in Africa there's a custom. When there's a muzungu, muzungu, can you say that? Muzungu. That means a foreigner. When there's a foreigner, they watch them, and they give them nicknames. And so I said, what's my nickname? And he said, oh, madam, you don't want to know. <laughs> and I thought, wow, is it that bad? I said, James, I really do want to know. What is it? And he used a word that I hadn't heard before. Enyumba. Can you say that? Enyumba. So I said, OK, James, what does it mean? Madam, you don't want to know. James, tell me. OK, madam, it means chameleon. Chameleon? You know what a chameleon is? I just happen to have one in my bag here, <laughs> thanks to the dollar store. <laughs> That's what a chameleon looks like. Can you see? This is a three-horned chameleon, and they have these long tails, and they creep along, and they're very clever. What do chameleons do that most animals can't do? They do, they change color. And I thought, what has that got to do with me? James, what's going on? He said, Madam, when you first came, you were white. But you know, the sun was very hot in those days up in the highlands, and so it made me change color because the next day I was pink. <laughs> and the children watched me, and then the next day, I became red. And then the next day, I became brown. And they thought that was very clever of me. <laughs> so I said, James, I think the children are very clever for thinking of that. But you tell them, it's not something that I can do. It's because of the sun shining on me that's making me change color like that. And so that was my new name. Enyumba. I wrote it on the bottom of here so I wouldn't forget, see, Enyumba. But did you know that one day you will all be given a new name? You know, in, uh, in Kenya they give names to babies when they're born, of course, but they're like, if you're born in the morning in Luo land, you're Otieno. If you're born on a Friday, you are Juma. And if you are born and you are a blessing, your name is Barak. Do we know somebody with that name? Barak. Hmm. A blessing. Don't laugh. <laughs> OK, so let me tell you about your new name. The time will come. Um, in Revelation, it says, Revelation 3 and verse 17. I'll read it to you. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone. And on the white stone is written a new name. That name no one knows except the one who receives it. So do you understand that? One day, Jesus is going to give you a white stone and a secret name. 
I wonder what he'll think about you. I hope he gives me a better name than Nyumba, but I have no idea. And let's all plan to be there so we can show each other our stones. But it's secret, so that means we can't tell anybody, right? Okay, you can go back to your seats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Summer. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all today. I hope you are blessed today already with our worship service. I know that I am, and I'm loving this weather, and uh, I'm, I can't wait to get back out into it today on this beautiful Sabbath day. Boys and girls, uh, what I usually like to do is have a word of the day, and I think there are some new boys and girls here, and the word of the day is going to be on the screen momentarily, is provide. And you want to count how many times Pastor Nate says the word provide, and then you'll meet Suzette over at the Fellowship Center, and you can get a prize if you are close. Let's pray together as we begin this message. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful to you for how you are working in our lives, working among us, working in us, and yes, even working in spite of us. And we look to you this morning 
and ask that you would touch our hearts, that you'd speak to us by your spirit, that you'd encourage us in the way that we should go, and that you would give us the courage to follow you wherever you may lead. Lord, I am one man, but you are an all-powerful God, and I pray that you by your spirit would speak today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's been a little while since I've been in the pulpit here. Uh, took a little vacation, and prior to that, I uh, was able to go to the Hills and Valleys Camp Out, which uh, is our church plant over in Oregon City. Had a good time with that, but during my vacation, Emily and I took a little retreat to the coast to celebrate our anniversary. 15 years of marriage the Lord has provided to us. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you. And we uh, went out to Lincoln City, and we went down to Yaquina and uh, looked at the lighthouse and looked at that natural area over there. Very, very beautiful. And after the first 24 hours, we kind of looked at each other, and, and we're like, oh, this is what it's like to not have kids around all the time. And it was, uh, we missed our children, but it was, a, it was a new, exciting experience that we hadn't had in a while. So we got, to, we got to do whatever we wanted to do, right? Um, but we really enjoyed the natural areas, walking along the beach. And when we were there at the Yaquina Natural Area, which is a new port, we got to see lots of birds, lots of seabirds, and, and I enjoyed that. And um, saw all sorts of birds uh, fishing and bringing food to their young, uh, saw an oyster catcher for the first time. That was exciting to me because I've been wanting to see that ever since I started birding. But we also, um, as we were looking around and seeing all this, we were just thinking about, and, and I was thinking about how God provides for our many needs. And the Bible tells us that uh, he even cares for the birds. And he, he cares for all of us in all of our needs. Now, we also saw a seagull, believe it or not, at the Oregon coast, Lots of seagulls. And there was a mommy seagull perched on this rock overlooking the ocean. And we could see it just from the fencing that we were at. And she had her wings out and she was protecting her young because there were turkey vultures flying around and hawks. And that makes me think of how we look around the world that we live in. And we can see all the blessings and the provisions of God but yet we live in a world where there are challenges. We live in a world where we can identify God's hand, but we can also see that there is hardship and that there is fear in this world and that God is working nonetheless. God promises to be with us. He promises to care for us. And in the scriptures, he also talks about like a mother hen covering her chicks, he will protect his people. So this world, it continues on. We have challenges. Of course, we're dealing with inflation. And I know we didn't gather together here today to talk about inflation or gas prices, but they're very real that we're dealing with. Um, there are many people with mental health challenges um, people dealing with fear, and of course, recent news and ongoing news are all the shootings that we have in, in our country. And the world seems to be spiraling out of control, and the question that a lot of people are asking is, does God really care? Does God really care? And I hear things like, Pastor, I'm going through relationship problems does God really care? Pastor, I feel like my marriage is falling apart. Does God really care? Pastor, my, my kids are, are going wild and, and don't want anything to do with God or with church or with me. Does God really care? Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with making ends meet. I've lost my job. I'm losing my income. Does God care? Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with these burdens in secret. Does God care? I'm, I'm dealing with with challenges. Why is it so hard to change? Does God care? Well, God does care. He is our provider. He is called Jehovah Jireh, and he is interested and, 
and engaged in our lives. Some people have a picture of God that he is aloof and indifferent to our needs, that he's just sitting up on the clouds and twiddling his thumbs and that he doesn't really care. This is called deism, that that God has just set things up and he's not involved at all. But the Bible tells us and reveals a different picture of God, and we're going to look at that today. Jehovah Jireh is a term that is used for the Lord, and Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 was the first one to use it. And uh, Michael, and not yet with that slide, please. Thank you. (laughs) The AV crew is trying to help me out. I I appreciate it. I love all of you. Thank you. (laughs) And and the communication is is the trick. But there is a story that is kind of jarring to the modern ears and eyes in that, uh, thank you, Doug, in that God, as he's talking with Abraham, he tells Abraham that his descendants are going to be more numerous than the sands of the sea, of of the shore, and more numerous than the stars in the heavens, And he and his wife, Sarah, have this child, Isaac. And one day, God calls him to take his son, the son whom he loves, and go up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. Now, this is a strange act, a strange thing that God would call anyone to do, and A burnt offering, we need to be sure that we understand what that is. A burnt offering is something that was made to make atonement between one and and the Lord. People would bring their their lambs or their animals to the tabernacle or to the temple and offer them as burnt offerings for atonement, to restore that relationship. And here God is asking Abraham to do this with his son. So Abraham brings Isaac along with him. They're headed up the mountain. They bring the servants. They bring the donkey. They load up the donkey with with the supplies, with wood, and they're bringing fire up there. And Isaac starts to look around. And Isaac is, is wondering, Father, I see the fire. I see the wood. But where is the animal for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. He's telling Isaac that God is Jehovah Jireh, that he's providing. Now, we don't know a lot about this situation. We know some from inspired writings. But I want to talk with Abraham about this experience in eternity. Because I have four children and I can't imagine the, the challenges, the wrestling that he must have gone through in bringing his son up there and, 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 and saying this to him. We do know that the Lord was leading him. We do know that Abraham, with all of his heart, he wanted to serve the Lord, to follow the path that God had laid before him, to obey him, to fulfill God's plans in, in being the father of nations, And here, God is asking him to do this. So, God will provide a lamb. Abraham binds up his son with ropes and places him on an altar there on the mountain. And he raises a knife to sacrifice his son and he's stopped by an angel of the Lord. And that is a very important part of this story because God wasn't asking Abraham really to do this. He wasn't going to allow this to really happen. This is something that the, the, the pagan religions would do and, and pro- possibly the religions that, that Abraham left behind when he was called out of his homeland. God stops him and says to him, through this angel, I know that you fear the Lord. In other words, I know that you, that you trust me. I know that you, you are, are relying on me. I know that you're willing to do anything. 
And since you would not withhold even your son, I know that you fear me, that you love me. Verse 13, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram, a male sheep, caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place, the name of the place, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And as I understand, that same location was where Jerusalem was built. God will provide. Jehovah Jireh. He is the one to whom we can rely upon with any need we may have. And often what we end up doing is instead of going to the Lord with our needs, we turn to other things to cope. Well, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm feeling burdened and challenged, so maybe, maybe I'm going to binge that Netflix show, or I'm going to, to just m- numb my mind with, with social media. We go to things to help cope with these challenges, but God is saying to us, I am your provider, come to me. That is who the Lord is. And we know that God provides for all. He sends, as the Bible says, the rain and the sun on the just and the unjust. He takes care of all of his creation. At one point, Paul, in talking with some other pagans, he said that in him, in the Lord, we live and move and have our being. God is the one who is responsible for our life. He's given us every beat to our heart and every breath to our lungs. And he's given us a place to live. On this planet, Colossians 1, 17 to 18, Paul also says this. He says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. God is responsible for the, for the life that we have, for the, the time and place that we, that we dwell He is the one who is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. What I would like for us to do this morning is we're going to focus in on Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to look there at a few things that the Apostle Paul says in light of our understanding of God as a provider, the one who provides for us. Paul, when he wrote this letter... He was in prison. We have to contextualize this. He's writing a letter to the people in Philippi, his beloved church members. He's writing this to them, and he is in chains for the sake of the gospel. So in keeping this this context in mind, we've got to remember that this letter is being sent to these people from a man in prison. What I'd like to do is move quickly through Philippians chapter 4 to see how Paul brings out God as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Early in the chapter, he says this, and I think many of us know this verse. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying here is that God as provider provides us with peace. And we're not going to have peace so long as we go to other things besides God to cope with the anxiousness of this world. Remember, he says, be anxious for nothing. Well, I would love, I would love to have that all the time, right? How many of you have been anxious about something this week? I think all of us have, right? Yeah. Some of you are bold and going to show your hands. Yeah. We all have stuff that we're dealing with. But I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. How many of us are bringing these things to the Lord in prayer? How many of us will come to the Lord with our burdens? That is what God is inviting us to do. In everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the result of that is that we will have peace. 
God is wanting to provide us with peace in spite of the circumstances that we're in in this world. And I don't know about you, and I hope this has happened for you, but I've had many times where I am dealing with hard stuff, where I am anxious, where I am stressed out, where I've got burdens, where I don't know the way through. And I come to the Lord, and I pray, and I just unload on Jesus. I tell him all that I am going through, and I ask for him to be my Jehovah Jireh, to take care of these things. And I come away from this time of prayer with a peace that doesn't make sense. It surpasses understanding. It's something only God can do. We're not going to find that with anything that is offered to us in, in the culture that we live in. We only find that when we bring our requests to the Lord. So, Paul is saying that God provides us with peace. And that peace comes through prayer, through knowing God is in control. This week, I was um, having one of my weekly meetings with someone I am discipling, and we're journeying together. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we came across this passage this week that stood out to us. It says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Your father, this is Jesus speaking, your father knows what you need before you ask him. But we like to get ourselves stressed out. If you were to look at my life, I spend time stressing out about stuff for a while, and then I'll go and pray, right? But God knows exactly what we need before we even ask him. Peace here is a state of calm in spite of our circumstances. Just yesterday, we took a family day. We went out to um, Fort Stevens out near Astoria and Warrington. We went to the coast. It was a beautiful summer day in the mid to high 70s, and the kids were playing in the ocean, and it was nice and shallow. Well, I have a three-year-old boy named Noah, and... Um, Three-year-olds, as many of you know, are always right, or at least they believe they are, and they, they, know, they know what they're going to do, and they want to do it in spite of all reasoning. So we were there playing in the, in the water, and my oldest three, they're, they're out there swimming, and it's, it's shallow enough, and um, we have some set rules for how far out you can go. Well, I'm, I, have, I have Noah, I'm holding him by his hand, and we walk out onto the sandbar, and I knew that there was a part that kind of dips down, and he, he knew that too, and he wanted to go over there, but Noah, he doesn't swim without a life jacket. We didn't bring life jackets, so we're, I mean, we're vigilant no matter what with our kids, and um, Noah didn't want me to hold his hand anymore, and he wanted to do it himself, so he breaks away from me, and he's, he's walking. I said, Noah, it's going to dip down there, and I don't want your head to go under the water, and he, he kind of walks down, and he gets he gets to where the water's right here, and he's looking at me like, see, I can do this. Well, we're in the ocean. We're not in a swimming pool. And so a wave comes along and goes over his head, and then he's trying to swim there while I'm on him. You know, I'm, I'm right there. And so his head was under the water, and it, it wasn't like a, a big, crashing, foamy wave. It was, you know, I could still see him through the water. And I picked him up right away before any water got in his mouth or anything. And he looked at me just kind of, kind of stunned. And I said, see, that's, that's why I needed you to hold my hand. I need you to be careful because these waves can come along and, and knock you over and, and, and go over your head. Well, our Father in heaven knows exactly what, he, what we need before we ask him. If Noah could have asked me while he was under the water to help him, he would have, but I was there. I was on it. And there are waves of, of life that come through. And just as I was with Noah in the waves, God is with us through the waves of life. Paul also says this in the next verse. He says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, he's talking to his people, and the God of peace, the one who provides us that peace that surpasses understanding when we pray to him, the God of peace will what? He will be with you. 
God promises us peace beyond our circumstances, beyond understanding, and he promises us to provide us with his presence. And when the waves of life come along, we have the assurance that that God is there through those waves. But there's a call. Paul calls us to walk in the ways of God, to walk with him, to, to, to be obedient, and God is providing his presence. Now, loving parents provide things to their children, food and shelter and education and care. But one of the most important things that children need is a parent who is engaged with them. They need their parents to be present. In fact, when little babies are born, if they don't have that present parent and that human contact, they can be fed, they can be changed, but they cannot survive because of the lack of the presence of a loved one. That's called failure to thrive. It's real and it happens. But God is a present parent. And Paul here is saying, come near to God. Know that God is near when you're in need. And sometimes we feel like he's far off, disengaged. He's not a near parent, but he is present. What else is said about provision? Moving a little bit faster here. Verses 11 to 12, Paul says, as he's talking with his people, he says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be what? To be content. Where is he? He's in prison. And I don't know about you, but I'm trying to imagine being content in prison. And it seems like it would be a hard thing, and, and I'm not even content in traffic, right? <laughs> We're not even content waiting for our food in a food line, right? Here, Paul is content in prison. He's saying, in whatever state I am, I'm content. I know how to be abased. I know how to, be, to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. What Paul is saying is that God provides us with contentment. And this is a little bit different than peace. Peace is, is, is a feeling of, of calm in spite of, of circumstances in this context. And here, Paul is talking about contentment being okay with our circumstances and finding finding a a trust in the Lord in the midst of all of that. And God promises to provide contentment in every situation, in any circumstance. And so, Paul is encouraging his people to be content with where we are, knowing that we can trust the Lord, we can be confident of the Lord's leading in our lives. We are tempted in the culture that we live in, though, to look at our neighbor, to look at the other people in our lives, and to have jealousy if they have what we don't have, or doing better than we have. Or, or we'll just compare ourselves to others, and, and that, that gets us either to feel superior or inferior. Well, God is not wanting us to be in that place, but to be content knowing that he is in charge, that we would look at him at Jehovah Jireh, that we would count our blessings and be comfortable with wherever God leads. At one point in the Proverbs, chapter 30, verses 8 to 9, it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. This proverb is all about finding contentment with whatever the Lord is providing. But not being in the place of poverty or riches. But Paul is saying that he has experienced both and found contentment within this. This is also why Jesus encourages us when we pray to say, give us this day our daily bread. God, give me whatever it is you want to give me, whatever I need to get through my day, whatever it is that you want to provide to me. Now, after Paul speaks of these things, of being content and finding peace in the Lord, he also says what is now one of 
the most favorite things that Christians like to quote. We probably are familiar with this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen to that. Now, the Bible at large does tell us that God is the one who gives us boldness, who gives us strength, who, who gives us the ability to work and to do good. But Paul is not actually talking about those things here. We like to put this on social media. We like the, the sticker, the bumper sticker. We like to quote this when, when we want God to, to help us with something. But what really is being said here, what Paul is really saying is that God is the one who can help me endure anything. It's not about God giving me the ability to be the superhero. Remember, God is, well, Paul is speaking in prison here. But Paul is saying that God provides us with the strength to endure every situation. He's not saying that God is going to give him the ability to bend these bars, to break them, to break out of his chains. He's not saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me so that he can do whatever he wants to do. But that God, as Jehovah Jireh, will give us, give him, give us the strength to endure whatever life throws at us. The ability to handle whatever circumstances we face. I remember when I was young in the faith, I, I had my my one and only car stolen. It was a Honda Accord, and it was stolen from right outside my parents' house. And my roommate from college was living with us that summer, and he said, Nate, how come you're not raging right now? How come you're not mad? I said, well, I, I don't know. But looking back, I knew it was because I, I realized that God's going to help me through this. He's going to provide, and there was no use in yelling and screaming and kicking and throwing things because God ultimately is the one who is in charge. Now, I wish I could honestly say that I behave that way all the time. <laughs> but it's a moment in my life where I remember God giving me strength and peace in spite of the challenges that were there. So, Paul's epistle here to the Philippians is like a soldier facing the possibility of death. He wrote this when he's suffering in prison, when he was weary and he's, he's wondering if he might lose his life for Christ. And he wrote to the people that he loved. And he wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever may come. Whatever I may face. And, and in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have an understanding of, of prophecy. We have an understanding of what's on the horizon. And I hope and pray for you and for me that we can also say, I can endure, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever we face, whatever's around the corner, it's worse than inflation, it's worse than gas prices going up. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He's the one who provides. And then finally, Paul, near the end of chapter 4 in the, in the epistle itself, Paul says this, he says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that God does provide for our needs. For whatever need is on our plate. Notice that it's not our wants, but it is our needs that God provides for. I remember what it is to find a house. When I was, when my family and I were transitioning over here, we were still living in Madras for a month before we found a house. We were working here for a good month uh, while still living in Madras. That didn't work out too, too well. But God came through. He provided. Or finding transportation. It can be very stressful. It can be very hard. And God does provide for our needs. He comes through and all throughout history, God has been Jehovah Jireh for his people. For example, when his people of, in, in Israel, his people of Israel were, were wandering the wilderness, 
On the way to the promised land, God gave them manna every morning. He provided for their needs. In the New Testament, Jesus' disciples saw that the people were hungry. There were 5,000 of them, and they had no means to feed them. But Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish to feed the 5,000. With 12 baskets left over, Jesus was Jehovah Jireh, meeting the needs of those who were in need. So I want to ask you, and you don't have to say it, but in your heart, think about this. What is your greatest need right now? What is your greatest need? What do you want to bring to the Lord today and lay at his feet and say, Lord, Jehovah Jireh, help me. Paul says, God supplies for all our need in Jesus. Maybe you need help in a conflict you're dealing with. Maybe you need help overcoming something. Maybe you need some sort of material provision. Maybe you need to overcome an addiction or, or, or you need to make strides in spiritual growth or in your health. Maybe you need strength or endurance or, or, or courage. Paul says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Jesus. Now, Abraham's greatest need was to know that he was favored, that he was in the favor of God, that he was on the right path. And God intervened and he provided. And God also intervened and provided for us the Lamb, Jesus. God, this is the greatest provision. He has provided for our salvation. In another book, in another Letter, Paul says, God did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all. You see, our greatest need is the spiritual one, is the salvation one. And what we find is that Jehovah Jireh provides for our salvation. He has done all that is needed, and he is doing all that is needed to save his people. Remember, Abraham said, my God, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. I don't know if he knew that he was speaking a prophecy here, that God ultimately would provide the son for the sins of humanity. God saw our greatest need and he helped. And our problem is that we've all sinned. And as Isaiah says, our iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. But God solved the problem because he's Jehovah Jireh. He saw our need and he provided. Jesus willingly left heaven and he descended. He became a human. He became a servant and he died a criminal's death in our stead so that death because of sin, would not overcome us, but that we would be overcome by the grace and love of God. Isaiah also describes Jesus by saying this, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He also says, well, all, we all, excuse me, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep, before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. God was and is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is the one that we can trust in. And rely upon. In these passages that we looked at today, I, I don't know about you, but I believe that there emerges a picture of God, a picture of a God who is not indifferent, a picture of God who is interested and engaged in our struggles. He's not aloof to the challenges that we're dealing with. He is a provider. He looks to us and longs to bring us peace and strength and endurance through the trials of life. And above all this, God as a provider decidedly gave us 
the Lamb, Jesus, for our salvation. So does God care? Yes, he does. He is Jehovah Jireh, our God. Let's pray. Lord, how can we thank you enough for what you have done and are doing for us? Lord, I I know for me that I need you, and I know for all of us we need you. And Lord, you know our lives because you've made us, and you see us, and you're present with us. And I pray for each one of us that you would meet us even today in the place of our need, and that you would provide what we need. Lord, we also know that Maybe what we think we need is not what we really need, but we invite you to give us what we really need. Help us to courageously accept that like Abraham. and Help us to know we can trust you. Lord, perhaps we have gone astray and we are in need of the gift of repentance today. If that so be the case, Lord, give us that. Give us the courage to repent and turn and come to you, knowing that you are a gracious, merciful, kind, and loving God who's provided to us what we need in Jesus. Thank you for these words we have meditated upon today, Lord. And as we go from here, Lord, May the joy of our salvation be in our hearts. May you provide to us a joy that bubbles up, that flows out, that draws people to Jesus. Thank you, Jehovah Jireh. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you and keep you and be with you, my friends. Happy Sabbath to you. In just a few moments, we're going to have potluck and enjoy what God has provided to us over in the Fellowship Center.